Well, take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John as we continue in chapter 6. We're returning to chapter 6 after taking a brief reprieve last Sunday as Brother Joe Galloway preached a very timely message on September 11th about what it means to be a godly citizen of the kingdom of God and to be citizens of this country fulfilling our civic responsibilities. Two weeks ago, whenever I was in Guatemala, Wade preached from chapter 6 here where we were introduced in this discourse to the first I am statement Jesus makes as recorded in the Gospel of John. I've told you before that the Apostle John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has organized his gospel account around seven signs or miracles and seven I am statements. These seven signs or miracles are just a fraction of the thousands John was a personal eyewitness to. He could record many more, but he recorded those so that we might get a glimpse of the glory of Jesus, his nature, his identity. But he also records these seven I am statements. And the one that we're looking at today is a continuation of from two weeks ago. This statement, I am the bread of life. He makes these seven statements. And this one here, he makes three times actually in this chapter. First in verse 35, which Wade covered a couple of weeks ago. And then our focal text today in verse 48 and also verse 51. This is the first of seven I am the bread of life. He also will say, I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheepfold. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the true vine. Now, with these seven I am statements, Jesus is really accomplishing two goals. Number one, he's making a personal declaration about his deity. I am. That's the name of God. He is declaring, I am God. But beyond that, with these statements, he is introducing us to aspects of his ministry. He's introducing us to the purpose for which he came to this world. And these I am statements are really metaphorical. They are metaphors for his ministry and for his purpose. So we know what a metaphor is, right? Metaphor is a figure of speech. You use them every day. You may not notice that you use them, but you do, and I do as well. Uh, I was particularly mindful of metaphors as I was writing this sermon, and I can't believe how many metaphors I use regularly in preaching and in teaching. Here's some metaphors you've probably used. Well, that ship has sailed, right? Um, That was a slam dunk. The train has left the station. He's one fry short of a Happy Meal. We scraped the bottom of the barrel when we hired him. (laughs) This teacher, she has a heart of stone. Is it any wonder her classroom is a zoo? So these are metaphors, and there are many, hundreds, thousands of metaphors we use. And when preaching in a foreign country using a translator, you begin to discover a lot of these metaphors don't translate into other cultures. But these are all metaphors not to be taken Literally, same with the I am statements of Jesus. When Jesus says, I am the door, it doesn't mean he becomes a slab of wood. It's a metaphor that he is the entryway into the kingdom. When Jesus says that I am the the, uh, bread of life, like we'll see today, it's a metaphor. When he says, I am the true vine, it's not that he's going to start producing grapes from his arms and fingers. No, he's the source of life. By calling himself the bread of life here in chapter 6, he's not saying he's made up of wheat flour, yeast, water, and salt, and you bake it a little while and you'll get a loaf. That's not what he's saying. This is a metaphor. Just as bread is a sustenance for life that we must consume, so also that points to Jesus, who is a substance who must be consumed. Now remember, within this context of chapter 6, This is following, this instruction is following perhaps the most fantastic miracle Jesus performed other than the raising of Lazarus from the dead. The feeding of upwards of 20,000 people with a little boy's lunch with five barley loaves, little English muffins of bread. And you see the crowds, they are following him. Why? Because they got their bellies filled. They want Jesus to continue to meet their physical needs temporary needs. But this is all illustrative of Jesus actually coming as the bread of life to meet our 
spiritual, eternal needs. So think about it. If Jesus is speaking metaphorically here, if he's speaking figuratively that he is the bread of life, then that means somehow we must consume him. Somehow we must eat him. But what is eating? That's a metaphor as well. You've heard the phrase before, seeing is believing. Well, in this passage, here's the metaphor. It's the title of my sermon. Eating is believing. Eating, in this passage, is figurative for faith. It's for believing. Eating and drinking, for that matter. Those are metaphors for believing. Now, the people to whom Jesus is speaking here in John chapter 6, they didn't catch the metaphor. It went over their heads. They were lost like a ball in tall weeds. Those are metaphors too, by the way. And they missed it. And not only did they miss it, but Jesus' metaphorical language completely freaked them out. So look with me in your Bible as Jesus is going to talk about not only eating bread, but eating his flesh and drinking his blood. John chapter 6, beginning in verse 41. This is the word of the Lord. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood... You have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. Now, this is a long passage, and there's no way I'm going to be able to touch on absolutely everything in this passage. But one thing we see here in this sermon is that Jesus is giving here in the synagogue in Capernaum is that he is offending people. He's offending people. And I can tell you, as a preacher, there have been times I've offended people by things I've said. In fact, there have been multiple occasions I've said something from this pulpit, and I've seen somebody stand up and walk out the back door. Not only that, I remember shortly after I came here, just a couple months after I was here, I was preaching, and I looked over in this general direction. Don't worry, he's not here. And I looked over there, and I had said something, and he looked right at me as I'm preaching, and he goes, well, I guess he didn't like that right? Now, often what a preacher will do is if they say something offensive that is received offensively, offensively, we'll try to explain what we mean, or we'll tone down the rhetoric. Jesus offends the hearers. He doesn't explain it, really, and he doesn't tone down the rhetoric. In fact, he ramps up the rhetoric. Oh, you think it's odd that I'm saying you need to eat the bread that's me? You need to eat my flesh. My flesh is true food. You need to drink the blood that's me. You need to drink it. It's true drink. He is ramping up the rhetoric. Eating, remember, is believing. That's the metaphor. How do I know that's what he meant? Because of the two 
emphatic statements he makes in this discourse that begin with the words, truly, truly, or in Greek or Aramaic, amen, amen. Two emphatic statements he makes. Look at the next slide. Verse 53 first, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now that statement is the metaphor that's explained earlier in verse 47 with this emphatic statement, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Eating and drinking is the metaphor, the figure for believing. So what's the subject matter for this passage? It's very simple. Belief. (laughs) Belief, faith, trust, reliance. And that should not be a surprise to us. For instance, this is the subject matter of the whole chapter 6, and this is the subject matter of the entire Gospel of John. We've referred to the thesis statement of John's Gospel in chapter 20, verse 31, multiple times. John says, these things I've written to you that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the point of the book of John, that you would believe and that by believing you would have life. And that's exactly what Jesus is talking about here with this metaphor of the bread of life. Eating is believing. Now, as we study this passage, there are some very intriguing truths about faith about saving faith, about belief that begin to emerge from the text as you study it. In fact, there are four that I want to point out from John chapter 6. The first reality I want us to consider is this. Number one, I want us to consider the individual obstacle to belief. The individual obstacle to belief. Whether or not you know it, every human being on the planet has an obstacle in their lives to believing in Jesus. You have an obstacle in your life to true faith in Jesus. The same is true for those who were listening to him that day in the synagogue in Capernaum. They each individually had an obstacle to saving faith. What is that obstacle? We see it on display there in verse 41, the first passage of our text. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Now, by saying he's the bread that came down from heaven, he's saying he is deity. He's saying he is God. He came from God. And what did they respond to that statement? They began to grumble among themselves. Interestingly, this word grumble that's used here and also in verse 43 is the exact same word in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, of all the people of Israel whenever they didn't get what they wanted in the wilderness from Moses. The Bible says they began to grumble against Moses. Well, I wish we were back in Egypt where we had onions and garlic to eat. They were grumbling. All through this chapter, there are intimations and hints and signs pointing back to Moses' ministry and how it's portrayed in Jesus. We've seen that connection already, but think about it. Standing before these people in the synagogue in Capernaum is the Son of God the second person of the Trinity in human flesh. Friends, never has there ever been a more gifted communicator. Never has there ever been a more profound preacher. And beyond Jesus' persuasive preaching was the fact that for the better part of two years, he has been performing miracles, healings, signs, and wonders up and down Judea and Samaria. The proof of who he claims to be is overwhelming. And by the time you get to the end of this chapter, most of the people quit following him. They did not believe. It's just a handful. There wasn't just a spattering of skeptics here and there among the 20,000 or so that were fed on the mountainside. No, it's whittled down so much that Jesus turns to the 12 and says, everybody's abandoned me. Are you going to abandon me too? The proof is overwhelming. Jesus is the Messiah. How could they still be trapped in unbelief with all this compelling evidence that has been before them? He filled their bellies with miraculous food. He walked on the water. He's healed the sick. How could they not believe? They each individually had a personal obstacle to faith. And guess what? You do too. Every single one of us has an obstacle 
in our lives to true faith. Now, on the one hand, that's quite a bit of a relief for me as a preacher because that means even Jesus, the most gifted preacher, most people left following him. And what that means, friends, is it's not the profundity or the, the clarity of the preacher as much it is, as it is something else that brings people to faith. So what is the obstacle to belief that we all have? It's called the sin nature. The sin nature. Theologians refer to this, and it's on the next slide, the total depravity of man. You may have heard that phrase before, total depravity. Here's what total depravity means or what it doesn't mean. It, total depravity does not mean that you and I in our sinfulness are as bad or as evil as we can possibly be all the time. That's not what total depravity means. What total depravity means is that there is not one part of your body, your life, your soul, your mind that is untouched by sin. You're totally depraved. Would you agree with that statement? We are all totally depraved. We're all polluted by sin. We have a sin nature. Now, did you notice how Jesus responded to their grumbling unbelief? Did you catch how he explained their unbelief in spite of the overwhelming evidence to the contrary? Notice verse 43 and 44. Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. Watch this. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. I want you to circle those two words, no one. Does that include you? Yes. <laughs> no one can come to Jesus. No one can express faith and belief, trust, dependence in Jesus apart from the drawing work of the Father who sent him. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about our capacity to choose, our ability to make decisions, and they'll describe that capacity God has given us with this phrase, free will. Anybody, anybody heard that phrase before, free will? It's okay, you can admit it in church, we're good. Free will. And if you were to describe the ability to choose or the capacity to make decisions as simply being free will, I would agree with you. Yes, I make decisions every day. I decided where I'm going to park my truck when I got here. I decided, you know, what clothes I'm going to wear today. Yes, I want to look like a referee. So uh, I, uh, you, you make these decisions. Thanks, guys, for pointing that out to me. <laughs> Somebody told me that earlier. You look like a referee. The stripes go this way for a referee. You make decisions every day. Is that free will? Well, if that's what you mean by free will, yes, I would agree with it, and the Bible would agree with it, but that's really not what I'm talking about here. If by free will you mean you are completely unencumbered by sin, if by free you mean a will that is not bent in a particular direction, if by free you mean a volitional choice between two options without any influence in one direction or the other, then I would say to you, based upon the word of God, none of us have a free will. Instead, we have a will that is enslaved to sin. We have a will that is bent to our depravity. We have a, a will, according to the reformer Martin Luther, that is in bondage, not free. Paul describes the will of the natural man in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He describes us as being trapped by, quote, the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So apart from Christ, whose will are you following? The will of Satan, the will of the devil. That is not a free will. That is a bondage, an enslaved will. This is why the statement Jesus makes in verse 44 is so critical. If we don't understand our individual obstacle to faith, if we don't understand the bondage of the will, we won't understand the absolute necessity of the drawing of the Father to Jesus. Look again at verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now, what is word meant by this word, draw? Does it mean to woo, 
to entice someone to Jesus, to lure or persuade. Maybe you're thinking of it like the classic image of the donkey and the carrot. And they put the carrot on the stick in front of the donkey to get him to pull the cart filled with a heavy load. Is that how God the Father draws us to Jesus? Is it this enticement, this lure, this wooing? Well, this word draw that's here in John chapter 6 is used eight times in the New Testament. And maybe if we saw how the word is translated in other passages in those contexts, it might help us understand what the Father's drawing looks like. I'm not going to look at all of them, but I'll show you four of them. Uh, Two of them are, are in this gospel account in John chapter 21. In John chapter 21, this is whenever Jesus appears to the disciples. They're out on the boat fishing. They've caught nothing all night. And Jesus says to them, hey, cast the net on the other side of the boat. And we all know what happens, right? They got such a catch of fish, they could hardly haul it in. In fact, look at John 21, verse 6. So they cast it, and they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. Same exact word as John 6, draw. Later in that chapter, Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish. Do you think Peter was uh, enticing the fish to come to shore? Trying to persuade the fish, the net, to come to shore? No, they were dragging it to shore. In fact, that's exactly how it's translated in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas had delivered a demon-possessed slave girl who was being used by the slave owners because of this ability she had to predict the future and do soothsaying. She, they were being used by her to make money. They delivered her from this demonic oppression. She lost the capacity to tell the future. And notice what happened. When her owners, the owners of the slave girl, saw that their hope of gain, of making money, was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. Did they entice Paul and Silas? They dragged them. Notice the next one, Acts chapter 21, Paul preaching Jesus in the Jewish temple, enraging the Jews there in Jerusalem. What happens to him there? Then all the city was stirred up and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple. So what does this drawing of the Father look like? All of these instances where this word is used in the New Testament, it's describing pulling something against resistance. Pulling something against resistance. What is the resistance of the drawing work of God the Father? The bondage of your will. Your sin nature, your depravity is the resistance. They hauled the net to the boat. Paul and Silas were dragged before the rulers. We don't see free will here. We see a captured, enslaved will. That's why no one can come to Jesus unless God the Father draws him to Jesus. You see this? It's intense. This is the obstacle to belief. We see it in the grumblers and the skeptics of Jesus' day. They had this mountain of evidence before them of the nature of Jesus Yet they refused to believe. All but a handful left and stopped following Jesus. Why do people not believe today? Because of the bondage of the will. We all have an individual obstacle to belief. Here's the second thing I want us to see from this passage about belief. Number two, the supernatural opening to belief. The supernatural opening to belief. Now, to be sure, don't miss this. You will not be saved if you do not believe in Jesus. You will not be saved if you do not exercise faith, trust in Jesus. It is required for salvation. But we're presented here with a profound dilemma. We have an enslaved will, but yet you must believe. We have the incapacity to believe because of our sin nature, but yet, you must believe. How then can anyone believe if, they, if we all have a captured and enslaved will? God, in his grace, provides a supernatural opening of the heart to express faith in Jesus. What a gift of grace. In fact, notice how Jesus appeals to the Old Testament. He quotes from the prophet Isaiah that is pointing forward to this new covenant era that we are living in today. 
He says this in verse 45. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Again, Jesus quoting here from Isaiah chapter 54, that all the children of the new covenant era will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard from God, and this is the theme through several prophets in the Old Testament, looking forward to this new covenant, New Testament era of belief and faith and the work of God in our hearts. Notice, in fact, what Jeremiah the prophet said in chapter 31. He says, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. This is God speaking. And I will be their God and they shall be my people and no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin No more. The prophet Ezekiel describes this New Testament belief as a heart surgery. Look at Ezekiel 36. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. Again, this is supernatural heart replacement surgery. Your unbelieving, depraved, sinful heart is replaced by the supernatural heart surgeon with a heart of flesh, capable of believing. By his great power, he opens our conscience. He moves in our hearts through the Holy Spirit to believe. Do you remember when Peter made his great, profound profession of faith about Jesus and who he is? Jesus asked first, who do people say that I am? And they begin to name off some things. Well, they say you're this, or they say you're that. And then he turned the question inward. He said, well, who do you say that I am? How did Peter respond? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus tells him, this is how you arrived at that conclusion. You examined all the evidence, you look at all the facts, and then you said, oh, this must be true. No, that's not what Jesus said. Notice what Jesus said. In Matthew 16, Jesus answered, And blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. God supernaturally opened the heart of Peter to believe and express faith in Jesus. And if you're here this morning and you can look at your own life and say, I believe in Jesus, it wasn't by accident. You weren't simply convinced to that position. God supernaturally opened your heart to believe. And I want you to notice this morning the the interesting juxtaposition of two words that Jesus gives in verses 44 and 45. The, The words are no one and everyone. Verse 44, Jesus speaking says no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. No one can come to Jesus unless God the Father draws him. Everyone who is taught by God will come to Jesus. Now, if Jesus' words are true, and they are, What are the implications for us? What are the implications for our evangelism? What are the implications for our sharing of the faith? What are the implications for missions as we have missionaries serving from here all over the known world? What are the implications for that? Well, look at this next slide. If no one can come to Christ unless drawn by the Father, then we as a church, as Christians, we should commit to those means of grace given and approved by God. I'm going to let that sit there for a second. You see, because there are many false conversions today. There are many who have prayed a prayer, yet have a life that does not demonstrate any allegiance to Christ. There are many who have walked an aisle and filled out a card. There are many who have responded at some crusade to a manipulative altar call. There are many 
who have been fear-mongered by some frothy mouth evangelist, but they're not saved. The church growth specialists today in modern evangelicalism are selling their gimmicks and their tricks to any church who will buy them so you can get those conversion numbers up. Conversion is a work of God alone. We can't trick people into the kingdom. We can't manipulate and coerce people to faith. It is a work of God alone. So what are the means of grace given and approved by God that we should use for evangelism and missions? It's simply this. Proclaim the word of God. Proclaim the gospel Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word concerning Christ. We see a vivid illustration of this truth in the book of Ezekiel. Back to the prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament. God took him to a valley of dry bones. You remember the story? And there he is with these bones of human beings just scattered in the valley, dried up. No life in them. No marrow in them. No skin or sinews connecting them. And what does the Bible say in Ezekiel 37? Verse 4 says, Then he, that's God, said to me, Prophesy, that's preach, preach over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Verse 7, So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I look, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. What a vision! of the power of the Word of God. And friend, can you remember that in your own life? When you maybe have heard the Word of the Lord many, many times, but there came a moment when breath came into you. You remember that? I remember it. Supernatural. Not human manipulation. He does this supernatural work of raising the dead to life. There's a Bible word for this, work of God. It's in Titus chapter 3. The word is this, regeneration. You might want to write that word down. Regeneration is the Bible word that describes the supernatural awakening of a sinner from spiritual death to spiritual life, where God opens the heart to believe and trust in Jesus. It is holy and it is completely a work of God. And because this is true, listen, friends, this gives us great hope. Here's why. I want you to think for a second about maybe that member of your extended family or maybe that coworker, neighbor, acquaintance that you might describe as unsavable. <laughs> that dude is such a sinner, such a reprobate. There's no way he would ever come to Christ. Let me ask you, is he any more spiritually dead than you were before your conversion? Dead is dead. You can't get more dead than dead. And if God raised your sorry soul from death to life, he can raise your family member. He can bring that reprobate that we would think is unsavable Through the power of the spoken word of God, he can do a miracle in the heart of human beings. This gives us great hope and great confidence. There's no one beyond the saving power of God. But that leads to the third truth about belief I want us to consider. Number three, the personal object of belief. When God overcomes and overwhelms our sin nature, our individual obstacle to belief, and when he opens our heart miraculously, supernaturally, to look with faith, what is the object? What is the focus? What are we looking to believing? Look at verse 51. And the bread that I will give For the life of the world is my flesh. 
Now, to the Jewish mind, Jesus is in a synagogue in Capernaum. It's a gathering of Jewish people for a Sabbath service. (laughs) To their minds, this would have been a revolting thought. Is Jesus actually calling people to cannibalism? To eat his flesh? Incredibly disturbing for them. Here's what's crazy. In the very next verse, we see their response. Verse 52, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They clearly thought that's what he was talking about. Cannibalism. They're thoroughly grossed out. So what does Jesus do? He tones it down a little, right? No, he ramps it up. Verse 53 begins with that word, so. Normally that Greek word there for so is translated, therefore. (laughs) Therefore, because they're totally grossed out, therefore, because they're disputing among themselves about him saying, eat my flesh, what does he say? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and, oh, by the way, drink his blood, (laughs) you have no life in you. Again, in this synagogue in Capernaum, they would have been very familiar with the Mosaic law. They would have been very familiar that the law forbade drinking blood. In fact, Leviticus 17 says you can't even order a rare steak. No blood in the meat. It's got to be all cooked out. And here's Jesus talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. So what did Jesus mean here? By eating flesh and drinking blood. Incidentally, this very passage is the proof text that the Roman Catholic theologians and apologists use to defend their doctrine of what's called transubstantiation. It's a big word. You don't need to know it. We won't be tested later on it. But this is the doctrine of transubstantiation that is believed in the official catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. Here's what transubstantiation means. They believe that when the elements of the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, the bread and the juice, the wine in their case, that when they are consecrated, that is, ordained, an ordained priest will bless those elements, those elements are transformed into the actual flesh of Christ, though it retains the appearance, odor, and taste of bread, and the actual blood of Christ, though it retains the appearance, odor, and taste of wine. In other words, they teach and they believe when you share in the Mass, On Sunday, and the priest delivers those elements, those have been blessed by the priest, and you are literally eating Jesus' flesh and literally drinking Jesus' blood. Is that what Jesus means in this passage? Ain't no cotton-picking way. (laughs) That's not what Jesus is talking about here. And they further believe that if you don't partake of the body and the blood of Jesus— then you will remain in your sins. That through partaking of those elements, grace is conveyed to you for the forgiveness of sins. That's why they call them sacraments. We do not refer to this as a sacrament because this does not convey grace to you. This is an ordinance that we observe symbolically to remember. So what is Jesus saying here? Remember the title of my sermon. Eating is believing. These are metaphors, and drinking, for that matter, is a metaphor for believing. We know this cannot be what Jesus is saying, that you have to literally eat his flesh and drink his blood in the communion elements to get forgiveness of sins, because that directly contradicts everything he's been saying in the Gospel of John up to this point. Forgiveness comes by faith alone. No act, no work, no sacrament. There's even a church in our community that says you must go through the sacrament of baptism in order to be saved. Uh Uh-uh. It's by faith alone. Like verse 29, Jesus says that, what we studied two weeks ago. Jesus answered them, this is the work of God. What's the work that we're to perform? Get baptized? Take a sacrament? Do some duty? No, he says this is the work of God that you believe. That's it. That you believe in him whom he has sent. But also what this means is that the flesh and blood that Jesus is talking about here is not the elements of communion. What is he referring to here? His flesh and his blood. His literal flesh and his literal 
blood. But remember, eating is believing. What's the object of our faith? Where do we place our faith? We look to the cross. We look to what Jesus did when he died on that criminal's cross. And there his flesh was given, his body broken, his blood was shed. And we look in faith. We believe that what Jesus did on that cross was for us. That what he did as he was sent by the Father was the substitute punishment and payment for us. In fact, look again at verse 41, 51. There Jesus specifically says that the bread of what Jesus is speaking is his own flesh. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. He explains the metaphor, the flesh. The bread stands for flesh. But the key word in verse 51, look at this next slide, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world. That word for is in place of, in the stead of, on behalf of. The bread that Jesus gives for the whole world is his flesh. Friend, just as we eat, when we sense the impulse of hunger, Sometimes we eat even when we don't sense the impulse of hunger. When we sense the impulse of our own sinfulness, when God the Father has drawn us to where we are awakened to the beauty of Jesus, we eat. Eating is believing. We embrace by faith what Christ has done in his flesh and his blood. What is the consequence of this belief? What is the result of this faith? That leads to the fourth and final thing as we move towards a conclusion. Number four, I want us to think about the er eternal opportunity of belief. Notice what Jesus said at the end of this discourse in verse 58. He said, whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus is speaking here of eternal life. And when Jesus talks about eternal life, he's not only talking about the quantity of life, that it is eternal, but he's talking about the quality of life. Eternal life begins right now. Eternal life begins at your conversion. We have been made spiritually alive to see the beauty of Jesus and his work. We have been made new to commune with God, our creator, not only in eternity for heaven, but right now. You know, researchers and scientists and nutritionists are always looking for ways to extend our lives, aren't they? My home state of Florida was discovered by Ponce de Leon because he was searching for the mythical fountain of youth. People are looking for the fountain of youth today, aren't they? Some way to extend our lives, some way to hold off the aging that's coming, that's inevitable. I recently read about some researchers with the Human Genome Project who have discovered perhaps a key in this search. It's the enzyme known as telomerase. Telomerase is an enzyme that's in the in DNA stream that rebuilds or prevents the dying of human cells in the human genome. And so they are researching how do we replicate the function of telomerase through RNA and through other DNA manipulation tools. And if their research continues, it may come about that we start our mornings not with a cu cup of coffee, but with a telomerase shake. <laughs> we can drink this down and extend our lives and stop the dying of our human cells. Well, we're all going to die someday. There is a possibility that scientists can figure out ways through the manipulation of our DNA to extend our lifespan. But friends, only those who look trustingly at the cross of Jesus will have eternal life. Who is the promise for? This promise of eternal life? Who is it given to? Who is it offered to? As we close, I would draw your attention to two words. Look at verse 51 and verse 54. Verse 51. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. 
Verse 54, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. Who is the offer of salvation given to? Anyone and whoever. Whosoever will may come. Anyone can come to the table of the Lord and say, I believe and eat the flesh. That is, believe in Jesus and his work. Here's the invitation for today. If the today, the creator of the universe, has supernaturally invaded your mind to see your own depravity and your own sinfulness and how that separates you from God, and if the creator of the universe has opened your heart to believe in Jesus, to trust in his vicarious work on the cross, here's the invitation to you today. Believe today. Believe in Jesus. I'll be here at the front. Come grab my hand while we sing the last song. And you tell me, I want to believe in Jesus. We'll talk about it. We'll pray together. And you can express your belief in Jesus. Here's another aspect of the invitation. Maybe earlier when I said, think of that family member, that friend, that coworker that you would label as unsavable. He's not beyond the reach Maybe during this time as we sing this song of response, you may want to come to these steps. You may want to grab a friend and you pray a prayer of dependence on God. God, unless you draw this person to Jesus, they'll never come. Draw them to Christ. Pull them against the strong resistance of their depravity. Draw them to Jesus. Would you pray that kind of prayer for the lost today? That's an evangelistic prayer. And that prayer is for anyone and whoever. And that leads to my last thought. No matter who you are and no matter what you have done, you can know life eternal when you believe on Jesus.